Once someone has accumulated a handful of snakes, oftentimes they'll start thinking about breeding them. And it usually goes something like this. I am so into this snake thing, I think I'm going to start breeding them. Let's see what I got. Uh, okay, those two males are normals, and the rest are special needs rescues. Perfect. That's a good start. I have nothing to breed. We're talking about how to plan snakes for your future breeding operation today. Plus, there's a new snake in the green room, so you'll be introduced to her in that video. Welcome to the green room. I'm Bob Bledsoe, and today's video is sponsored by Gray Family Snakes. Wait till you see that delightful family. They're, they're awesome. This is Bear, by the way. Bear is a snake that I purchased when I was strategically planning my breeding operation. Behind the camera is my brother Kent, who I've got a surprise for. Ooh, what's the surprise? Well, there's this t-shirt, for one thing, speaking of gray family snakes. Ah, cool! I love free t-shirts! Even though this one has a snake on it, beggars can't be choosers. Much obliged! Kent, that's not even the main surprise. Wait till later. What? I've had a number of people tell me lately that they're relatively new into snakes, but they're starting to research breeding, which is a cool thing to do. Oftentimes, though, I find that when people, you know, sometimes people will research for a year before they really start. But in that year, they'll start adding to their collection of snakes. And by the time they get to where they want to breed, they might be looking around going, oh, this is actually not the snakes that, that I wanted to get. I'm going to give you some strategy to building your perfect group of snakes for a future breeding operation. This isn't a video about whether you should breed or not. That's a separate video. This is just about picking out snakes. You see, I did it wrong. And maybe I did it right for my plans, which included a YouTube channel. I knew I was going to be documenting this and making videos as I went along my breeding journey. And I wanted a bunch of really cool snakes to show on video. Plus, I just wanted a bunch of really cool snakes. But let's talk about why that might have been the wrong choice just from the perspective of a breeding operation. I have a handful of favorite morphs in ball pythons, and most of them tend to be recessives which means that I'm not a cheap date. Recessive gene snakes are expensive. I also have a small space, so I can't have 100 snakes, but I jumped into the recessives that, that I like. So I, I jumped into Clown, Ultramel, Sunset, Pied. I have thus far held off on Monarch, Azanthic, Desert Ghost, there's a lot though that I could do. That gives me a room full of snakes with cool patterns and colors and everything, which is great for the viewers to choose their favorite and it's great for me because I like that. But it's not necessarily the smartest from a breeding perspective. Let's take Ultramel, for example. This is Molly Malone, my Ultramel girl. And if I was planning a, a breeding operation, I might say, Ultramel is one of my very favorite genes, so I'm gonna specialize in this. And what that means is that rather than just having one Ultramel female, I'm gonna probably buy five. And they're gonna be different, you know, some might be visual, some might just be hets with a couple of other uh, genes sprinkled in, incomplete dominant genes or dominant whatever, or, or maybe a het for another recessive. But let's say five females, just for example. And then I'm gonna get the coolest one or two males that I'm gonna that, that I'm gonna find, and what I mean by that is they're gonna be probably visual ultra males, and they're gonna have as many other genes as possible. And the reason for that strategy, rather than doing that with the females, is that I can take one male that's got a ton of other genes and put him to let's say that Molly Malone was just a normal. She she does look visually she is just a normal uh, ultra male. So I put that male to three of my just normal ultra male females and we get a whole smattering of different combos with, with that. Whereas if I spent all the money on my, on my female that had all those genes, I then just have six eggs that, you know, five, six, seven eggs each season that would have a smattering of those genes. So you want your males to be the gene heavy ones and the more expensive ones. I'm going to spend a lot more on the males than I do on the females. So the way I did it, let's talk about my Ultramel project. I've got Molly Malone, who is an Ultramel. She's a visual Ultramel. She is 100% het for pied, and she is 66% het for hypo. So I know she's got a pied gene, I know she has two Ultramel genes, and I know there's a decent possibility that she's got a hypo gene. Here's the mail for this project. Captain Farrell is a visual pied. He's very low white, but he is a pied, and he kind of looks visual hypo right now because he's in shed, but he is 100% het for hypo. Remember, Molly Malone is 66%, so we don't know if we have a hypo situation in the at least the first breeding. 
uh, of these two, and he is only 50% het for Ultramel. So we don't even know if we're going to get visual Ultramels. We, we know that we probably will see visual Pides in, in the pairing because the captain here is visual, and we know that Molly Malone is 100% het for Pied. So we'll probably see those. We don't know if we'll see Ultramels, and we don't know if we'll see Hypos. So... That's my Ultramel project. Let me show you another project that I'm dipping a toenail into. Sunset. This is the Sundance Kid. He's a cinnamon het sunset. He's also het for clown, which is really cool. And the group of females that he'll be going to is this one. This is Evie, and she is a vanilla het sunset. So again, if I wanted to really jump into the sunset project, my strategy would be to probably get five females that are, you know, even just head sun sunset out of recessive, sunset is very expensive. So maybe you just get four or five het sunset females, maybe with a few other genes. Then you get your visual one or two males with as many other genes as possible, as many other things going on. Maybe you get a male that's got a ton of other genes and he's just head for sunset, you know, something like that. But the point is, I'm going to spend more for my male or males than I did for my entire group of females, probably. That's kind of the ratio you want if you're trying to produce some really nice stuff all the way across a, a group in one project. So this one-to-one -one thing that I have going on in the green room is probably not the efficient way to go about a breeding project. You're probably picking up on that. Do you want to see this fantastic new snake? This is another recessive morph that we don't yet have in the green room. Drop your guesses. Hit pause. Drop your guesses. Recessive morph that we don't yet have in the green room. Put your guess in. This young lady came from Gray Family Snakes, and she is the most beautiful, contrasty, pastel, azanthic. She's 100% het for pied, but her dark, her black to whites are so beautifully contrasty, and I hope she stays close to that as she, as she ages. But she is just a stunning stunning animal. She's been with me a little while already. The Patreon supporters have seen her. She's eating like a champ and she's really well socialized, although she kind of came to me well socialized anyway. Really, really great little personality. But here's the thing. The snake is going to live here and be raised here, but she does not belong to me. That's weird. Who does the snake belong to? Wh whose snake is it? Bob, who does the snake belong to? Oh God, no. Yes, Kent, it was a gift. I refuse to accept the gift. I already have a snake, Eric the Murderer. Well, now you have a real snake. You can't refuse to accept a gift, Kent. Watch me. Hi there. Hey, hey Mom, I have a question for you. If someone were to give Kent a very generous gift, would it be considered rude for him to not accept it? Yes, it would be very rude. Thanks, Mom. You're welcome. Dang it. This snake was gifted to Kent from Gray Family Snakes. Let's talk to them really quick about that, as well as what their strategy was when they set up their breeding operation. Roger, Lori, and Samantha, so good to see you guys. Hi, Hi. good to see you too. Thanks for having us. Samantha, tell me about this snake that, that you guys sent. So Kent believes that snakes with colors are venomous, so we gave him a beautiful black and white snake so he wouldn't be scared of. That's that's really smart. He did say that a few <laughs> videos ago. That is a fantastic little snake. She's absolutely beautiful. Do you still have snakes on Morph Market from that clutch, Roger? Yeah, we've got uh, quite a few different snakes on Morph Market from the Azanthic to Pied uh, pairings that we've done either with Mojave and Pinstripe and a lot of pastel. Yeah, we pretty much just did Azanthics this year. When we first got started, really wanted to get into the Azanthic project. We like it a lot. When you guys started, did you just get a group of Azanthic snakes? No, we, we spent a lot of time looking at exactly how we wanted to do our pairings and, and kind of make something we really liked a lot, but also get a big bang for the buck and do something a little bit efficient, right? So we, we got one male and we got four females that would work well with that male. How did you guys decide on Azanthic? He really liked the the concept that it, it stripped the color out of the snakes so that it just leaves the grayscale. And then adding in some other morphs to it just helped brighten it or clean it up a little bit and make it more unique. So we've got a desert ghost head Azanthic male and we're we're going to let that Azanthic or that Desert Ghost Head Azanthic pair to these females. So, so next year, 
we'll be deep in that project with a bunch of exanthic het desert ghosts. <laughs> You've got a ton of cool snakes on Morph Market right now. I'm happy to say that I think I have your brightest exanthic. You've got That's some really cool ones uh, on there. There's a, uh, it's an exanthic pied het albino that's got some uh, yeah. leopard in it maybe. Yeah, we, we got really lucky with that one. One of our females that we got was actually double het for exanthic and pied, or so we thought, but she was visual albino. So we wanted to kind of play with that and, and see see if we could make a snow pied down the line. We got really lucky because it turned out she was actually a visual pied rather than a het pied. We just couldn't quite tell because of how yellow she was. Samantha, what's your favorite snake? I like my snake. He's pastel. He's really sweet and I really enjoy him. And that was, was the, the first snake you guys got, right? That's what yeah. started it all. Well, so when we first started um, looking for a pet for her, we, we started looking, what's what's a, what's the best pet for kids? And we came up with a ball python. Um, and so her first snake was Potter, our, our pastel. How many kids do you have? We have four. And all of them are helping to take care of the snakes. Yeah. The the, the, the one-year-old, not so much, but he likes to play with them. I, I yeah. love that you guys are all involved in this. Oh, it's an amazing learning opportunity. I mean, for the kids learning about business and genetics and, you know, even some of the questions that the kids ask, like, Dad, why do we need the boy snakes if the girls lay the eggs? You know, there's just a lot of opportunities to, to teach with this yeah. hobby. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So thanks for having us on. You know, we, we love watching the Green Room Pythons and seeing what you and Kent are up to. Um, you've taught us a lot. I know you're teaching other new breeders and, and especially keepers a lot about how to care for snakes. And um, you're doing a lot of good work. Very entertaining. So thanks for having us on. Oh, thanks, you guys. I really appreciate that. Thanks for being on. It doesn't have any colors, Kent. It's just black and white. So based on your science, the snake is not poisonous. And we'll also say it's not venomous. What are you going to name her? I'm not naming it. How about Anya? You mean Anya from Buffy the? Anya from Buffy the. Hi folks, Future Bob here. I'm just editing the video right now and I think this deserves an explanation. You see, back in the 1990s, Past Bob was a big fan of a TV show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Kent wanted to watch it too, but he doesn't like scary things. So I would edit out everything in the episode that I thought he would find scary. And each week, Kent was left with about a four and a half minute episode of Buffy the to watch. I also edited the title. Anya was a literal character. She was metaphorically very black and white. I think it's a good name. Okay, we can name her that, but as soon as she eats a person, we're changing her name to Anya the Murderer. That's a deal, Kent. Okay, folks, so that is Anya. She is azanthic, pastel, 100% het pied. There are a lot of things to think about when you're planning a future breeding operation. The number one thing being husbandry and just, you know, how do you take care of these snakes? So as we said, as people are planning, they're also adding snakes. And being able to figure out what you like and what you think you might want to be specializing in when, when it comes time is a good thing to do two to three years ahead of time because you got to raise all these snakes up, right? This is usually what we call the mid-video handwritten credit scroll, but I've changed it up this time. Thanks so much to the horde of keepers. All these guys on the list are helping out the channel a lot. Special thanks to our channel sponsor, Black Box Cages, and our video sponsor, Gray Family Snakes. You can check them out on Morph Market. I'll have their information in the description below. Hey, check out this video that just popped up on the screen. It's like a bonus care guide. It's extra stuff. I think you'll like it. <laughs> Thank you.